In a world of Democrats, there will be time for them to make profits. Now's not that time. And Republicans have abandoned free market principles to save the free market system. You need a voice of liberty. Look no further. You found it. Tom Woods. Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 325. What should libertarians think about the corporation? Is the corporation a creature of the state, or are the various corporate features features that would have evolved anyway on the free market spontaneously without any state involvement? Well, joining us today to help sort this out is Stefan Kinsella. Stefan is founder and executive editor of Libertarian Papers, and he's founder and director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. You may know him for his book, Against Intellectual Property. And over on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 325, I'm linking to a whole bunch of things Stefan is involved in, and of course to his website, stefankinsella.com. Before we get to my conversation with Stefan, let me remind you guys, I have a new book out, Real Dissent, A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. If you enjoy this show, you will enjoy that book, I think. You can check it out at realdissent.com, and I actually narrate the audiobook, and you can get a free copy of that audiobook via Audible through the offer at tomwoodsaudio.com. All right, let's turn now to Stefan Kinsella and my conversation with him about corporations and libertarians. Let's talk about the corporation today. This is one of the topics, as I look over the 320-something that I've done so far, that I haven't hit on yet, but that I've been meaning to hit on, because it is a subject of, uh, it's a bone of contention among libertarians. And in particular, I want to... uh, I want to focus on some of your own work on this subject, and as I was framing this episode before you came on, I was explaining to people what the controversy is, and the controversy is that you have the corporate form, and you have some libertarians even who say that that corporations are getting a state benefit by virtue of being incorporated, and that that state incorporation is a state benefit so libertarians can't support it. What's interesting about that, by the way, is that a book that you and I both like very much by Robert Hessen called In Defense of the Corporation was actually written as a response to Ralph Nader, who was making exactly the arguments that left libertarians are making now. That doesn't make them wrong. Ralph Nader's not always wrong. But this was thought of from the start, this kind of modern defense of the corporation, as a response to people like Ralph Nader. Right. What exactly is the corporate form, first of all, that's the cause of all this controversy. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Um, and uh, I think Hessen's work is the kind of seminal work on this on this issue. Although, to be to be honest, for libertarians, probably there's about three pages of that book which address the really only issue we ought to have. The rest of it's addressed to concerns that non-libertarians really have these kind of utilitarian arguments, um, etc. But um, you know, of course, you know, the word corp- corporation means body, like the word corpse or corp in Latin uh, or core. Um, and it's a legal form that's fairly recent in its modern form in in um, in the in the modern Western um, uh, society. Uh, it's a it's a way of organizing a, a firm or a business enterprise. Traditionally, in the past, you have individuals, which are persons, which we now call natural persons in the law, to distinguish them from uh, legal persons or civil persons, which are these artificial entities that have legal personality. Uh, the United States government is a form of corporation in a sense. All states are corporations because they have a legal personality. They are said to exist on that plane as, a, as an acting entity. Um, in private relationships, you know, individuals would have a business or they'd be employed or uh, have a shop, and they're just an individual. If you owned a shop, you called yourself a sole proprietor. If you partnered up with someone because you needed more than one person, unless they were employees or family members… Uh, you might have an, um, someone else who contributes capital, and you all work together, and that's called a partnership. So you just partner together, but that's really nothing more than a private contractual arrangement. Um, under those types of legal arrangements uh, in the past, 
each partner would contribute a certain amount of capital or have a certain share of ownership of this corp of this partnership, which was not a legal entity. It was just the way that these people arranged their affairs. Um, but if there was a debt owed by the partnership, like for a loan or even for some kind of tort, traditionally all the partners were held to be liable for the entire amount. There are many reasons for that, one of which was they wanted to hold themselves out that way so that they could um, have a good reputation. And also a lot of times these were like family-type businesses where there was honor involved and all this. Um, but sometimes they needed capital from someone who didn't want, really want to be too involved in the business. They just wanted to contribute some capital and have an ownership stake in it, but they didn't want to be liable for possible debts of the partnership. And so the the practice of limited liability partnerships arose. Okay, A limited liability partnership is one where there are two different types of partners. One, they're, they're general partners, which are the traditional type of partners who are each personally liable for all the debts of the entire partnership. And then there are limited liability partners who are only liable up to the amount of money that they invested in the partnership. So that was sort of the emerging model in early industrialism and capitalism. Um, and then the state stepped in and – came up with something similar to that, which they called the corporation. So the corporation is similar in many ways to the limited liability partnership. Um, the state allows you to register a charter with the state and call it a corporation, and the shareholders, the people that invest capital, are not liable for the general liability of the corporation. Only the corporation and its assets are, and as part of that process, the corporation was deemed to have what's called entity status. It has our legal personality, so it is a legal person. So that's how the corporation arose, and the criticism by the, li the libertarians is that they believe that when the state did this, it granted a privilege to the shareholders. It granted them immunity from general liability for debts of the corporation that they otherwise would have had in a free market, and therefore it's a privilege and ought to be abolished. All right, let's yeah, let's pick that up from there because I have to admit that years ago I fell into that error too. That I believed that that incorporation was a state privilege, and it was mainly because I hadn't looked into it all that deeply, and it was frankly an easy way for me to seem like I had some common ground with the left. Right. Hey, I'm against corporations too, and I'm kind of embarrassed as I look back on it. And frankly, it was you, really more than anybody else, who jolted me out of that. Because when we see the government involved in something, we're inclined to think that the government is granting something, but it could simply be codifying a relationship that could emerge inoffensively from a, a libertarian standpoint. And that's what I want to look at now. I want to look at the three areas that Hessen I identifies and that you're talking about here as uh, as really constituting the, you know, the major corporate features. So entity status, as you just mentioned, mm -hmm. or so-called corporate personhood. I think that's the, that's one of the key ones. Then perpetual life, I mm -hmm. think, is not as big a deal. Mm -hmm. And then limited liability. I want to get to, to all these. But when we say entity status, this is the same thing as corporate personhood, is it not? Yes. Okay, so this is this is a topic that, that comes up quite a bit on the left, too, because you see people chanting, corporations aren't people. And I think they think they're making some kind of profound point here. But I think everybody knows that a corporation is not actually a human being. And it seems to me that the entity status is a fairly benign uh, feature of corporations. What is it? What is the purpose of entity status? What does it do? Okay, so so yeah, so let's. Um, uh, that's the right place to hit it. And I agree with you. We should be suspicious of anything the state does, but we should also be suspicious of its claims, right? I mean, you know, we're used to the, the state providing education and roads. They take credit for these things. They co-opt them, right? Um, so it could be something like that's going on here. So we have to be careful not to just assume uh, this. And if you want to find common ground with the left, and we can get to this later, I would agree we should abolish state incorporation um, statutes and grants. But I don't think it would lead to what the left libertarians think it would. Um, um, so. So the entity status – yeah, so you mentioned the three features that Hessen sort of zeroed in on. Um, uh, there's uh, uh, limited liability. There is uh, perpetual duration, and there is the entity status. Now you say, what's the purpose of entity status? Um, I think there's two answers to that. The free market or the practical answer is it's just for administrative convenience. It's actually for the benefit of, of uh, people that the company might owe money to. They can just sue… 
a creditor can just sue you know, Chevron Corporation in the courts instead of having to sue 10,000 shareholders or some nebulous group of managers. It's actually an administrative convenience, and there's no reason why contractually or practically a court system couldn't allow something like that. But the state's reason for entity status is to pretend like they're granting some special privilege. So in a sense, the state and the left and the left libertarians all agree on this thing, that the state is granting a privilege to the corporation or to the members of the corporation. So the state grants them entity status. Why? So they can say it's a privilege so that they can say, well, we're get, we don't have to give you this privilege, so we can condition it or we can ask for something in return. For example, corporate taxation, <laughs> right? double taxation or corporate regulations. I mean you hear this kind of rhetoric all the time. Hey, we're giving you a privilege of entity status and limited liability, so you can't complain if we have corporate taxation or uh, capital gains taxation or regulations on what you do, Sarbanes-Oxley regulations, all these kinds of things. So basically it's an excuse for the state to regulate companies. So if we remove if, – if we were able to see that you could achieve something like a corporation without the, 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 the state's assistance just by pure private contract and, and private law… Then the state would have no excuse to tax the corporation. So I think it would be a good thing if we removed entity status, um, but I don't think it would result in unlimited liability for shareholders. Um, and by the way, the perpetual duration thing I think is easy to dispose of, as Hessen does. You could easily arrange for some kind of arranged uh, group of uh, – some kind of contractual network to live – indefinitely because the members can be switched in and out, just like a neighborhood association or a restrictive covenant or a trust. Um, there's just no reason you couldn't just have private arrangements to make some 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 so-called business firm last potentially forever or beyond the lifetime of its original um, founders. So to my mind, the only sticking point for libertarians is limited liability, and for that, we have to look at two types of, of limited liability. That is two types of debts that the shareholders are protected from, and one would be contractual liability like um, a debt to a creditor, someone who loans money to the firm or someone to whom the firm owes money like a, uh, a vendor. And the other would be someone who doesn't have a contractual relationship with the firm but who is injured by some kind of negligent act by the firm. So for example, um, a little old lady who is run over by a FedEx truck. Okay, that's a tort committed by the driver of the truck. So then the question is, who is she entitled to sue? Okay, so this is where we get into this question of limited liability. Right now, with limited liability, I would up until I read your stuff, I was more or less able to handle half the issue. Yes. I could an, I could handle half it. I could handle the the part that says that. Uh, with that deals with debts yes. and say then and you know and there's no reason that can again contractually creditors couldn't just say we understand that in lending you this money we will not be able to go into the college funds of every shareholder to get it if you guys don't pay we're you know we're we're limited to the assets of the corporation or whatever like th they would understand that and that and there would be a premium in the interest rate here reflecting the fact that they know that this is a limitation on how much they can grab in a case of default. So everybody could establish that purely voluntarily. Yes, and I think the, the, other, the, the other way around too, Tom. If you want to um, loan money to a corporation and you insist that the um, that the, the uh, some of the shareholders or some of the managers or some of the major shareholders, if you insist that they personally guarantee it, which is done sometimes in very small corporations, okay, then those um, – those uh, borrowers, the corporate borrowers, they're taking on more risk, and they may insist on uh, you know better terms for themselves because of that. So it's a it's a two way street there. Ah, oh, okay. I, I hadn't actually thought of it that way. So for example, but if you I wanted to loan money to Exxon, right? Um, you don't you know you don't really need the CEO to be personally guaranteed a loan because they have plenty of assets. But if you insist on that, they will just they'll turn you away and go to the next lender. So you would actually lose business. So it's a two way street. Now, what about the case, the classic case of the delivery driver? You know, who's he's an employee of the corporation. He's driving around and he strikes somebody and right. and and harms him. That that's the that's the issue that we need to tackle. Yes. No. So here's the fundamental issue I think for libertarians on this corporation issue, and in a way, it's like the IP issue. It's one of the issues where there's a lot of things taken for granted or a lot of assumptions, and you just have to step back and think 
what is everyone assuming here? And let's think more clearly about this to get to the heart of the issue, and then it starts becoming clear. And I was like you on this. I was confused on this privilege issue. You know, you don't want to be in favor of the state granting privileges, but we're in favor of capitalism, and there's got to be something wrong with, with, with what the leftists are proposing. And I discovered that basically this has been already addressed by at least three libertarians that I found, Hessen and also Roger Pallon and Rothbard specifically, and I'd never noticed it when I read him the first time because I wasn't thinking about you know corporate limited liability. But going back and researching this issue, all three have basically the same point, and it really comes down to a question of causation and responsibility. Um, the, idea, uh, the idea is that what should individuals be responsible for in life or what makes you responsible to someone else for a negligent act or for a tort, and the general answer is that if you commit it. Right, So the delivery truck driver at first glance is the person who committed uh, the tort. Um, so if you – what the people who want to abolish limited liability want to see happen is they want the shareholders of the corporation to be also liable. Now in the law, that's called uh, vicarious or secondary responsibility. That is there's a doctrine saying that A is responsible directly for his actions like the truck driver, and B is also responsible – for some reason. Now, there are several exceptions or cases in the law for which B should be responsible for A's actions. So if B uh, coerced A into doing it, right, like a hitman, uh, uh, like a mafia boss uh, ordering a hitman or coercing someone to, to do something, um, or if, uh, if B was uh, somehow in cahoots with the driver, you know, there, there's different exceptions like that. But in general, you, you can't just pick a random B out of the crowd and say, well, B should be responsible for A's for A's uh, liabilities. So, what the left and the libertarians who are on the opposite side of, uh, opposite side of this issue say is, well, B, uh, the shareholders are owners of the corporation, and therefore they should be responsible. So now, to me, this is the crucial issue. That's the mistake they make. Um, th- there's there's two mistakes in that formulation. One mistake is that they're assuming that ownership implies responsibility, but that is actually not what ownership is. Ownership is the legal right to control. It's not the right to be – it's not the obligation to be responsible for. It's the right to control, and a, cl- a clear example of that would be if you own a knife and someone steals your knife and they stab someone with it, you know, we would say you still own the knife because the thief doesn't gain title to the knife, and your knife is used to kill someone. But you're not responsible for that because you didn't perform it. So ownership by itself does not confer responsibility. It has to be action that causes responsibility. So then the question is what action did the shareholder perform that caused the harm to the victim of the negligence of the truck driver? Okay, So that's the real question, and the second mistake they make is they rely upon state classifications like when they say ownership. They say, well, the shareholders own the corporation. Well, that's kind of a, a legal classification that the state uses to call these guys owners, but we need to look as libertarians and as Austrians at the reality of the situation. If you remember, on ownership is the legal right to control a scarce resource. Possession is the factual ability to control a resource. That's what act, human action is. Now, as a matter of fact, if you're a shareholder in Google, you're not entitled to go have uh, your child's birthday party in their conference room. You're not entitled to take the corporate jet and go fly with it. So you don't have actual day-to-day control of that asset like an owner in the simple sense would. So just because the state labels someone an owner doesn't mean they're an owner in the actual libertarian um, legal sense. So if you get rid of these assumptions, which are kind of statist-influenced… Which libertarians just rely upon in their arguments. Then you have to go back to a causal question, um, and then the question becomes one of causation and responsibility. And then we get to the nub of the issue, and this is what Rothbard and Hessen and Palan point out. What they point out is that traditionally in the law, the reason that we assume that these sort of owners of a business are responsible for torts committed by the employees is the, is the doctrine of respondeat superior. Okay, which means the superior is responsible for the actions of his subordinate, and this is sort of a relic of like feudalistic times when you had like uh, you know an apprentice or you had a master, you had a small shop, a blacksmith and his apprentice, and or a small family type unit, and basically you do have a closely controlled setting where there's a manager 
who is really in charge of ordering the subordinates to do things. And so the doctrine arose of respondeat superior, that the master is responsible for the actions of his servants. And that doctrine is reasonable enough, although I'm not quite sure you could justify even that under libertarian principles. But let's assume that we, we could take that for granted that if there's a master controlling the actions of a subordinate, by, by which I mean giving orders, that we would say the master has some liability for what that servant does. Just as President Truman had liability for the bombs dropped over Nagasaki and Hiroshima because he gave an order to someone, right? Although that's a state setting, but still you could say he's responsible. He's not off the hook just because someone else did it. You could see relationships and hierarchical structures where masters ought to be responsible for the actions of the servants that they direct. So the question is what kind of theory of causation could you come up with that would show that shareholders are in that position like the managers of the corporation are? right? And the, the problem I have is that you can't because if you, if you broaden the scope of responsibility and causation so broadly that you say everyone who gives Exxon $30 for one share of stock is now on the hook for $50 billion of liability for an oil spill, um, then the, all that person did was give money to Exxon and have the right to vote in elections for the board of directors. Who don't themselves even run the company. They appoint managers who run the company. Okay, I could see an argument that the managers are responsible for actions of their subordinates. Maybe even an argument that the board of directors is responsible because they appoint the managers, although that's weak. But there is a potential for liability there, and that's why there's such a thing as D and O, directors and officers, insurance. This is what most corporations get. So even though they are potentially liable, they're not really personally liable because they're insured anyway. So this whole issue that the left raises is just a non-issue um, because even if you said shareholders should be responsible, then the corporations would just get shareholder liability insurance, and it still would be a non-issue. Um, they would still go on as before. I don't know if they'd call themselves corporations, um, but the point is if you were to expand the net of causality and say that just because someone has the right to vote for the board of directors in a corporation, which means the right to influence the outcome of an election, then they're responsible. Because and remember, every shareholder doesn't necessarily even they they haven't even given money to the corporation because you know I can buy a share from from an existing shareholder. You know I can buy a share of Exxon stock from Joe Blow and I give money to him. I never gave a dime to Exxon. So I'm not contributing money to Exxon. I only have the right to vote. What if I never exercised the right to vote? Or what if I vote and the vote didn't matter? Or what if I vote for a different candidate who lost? So these nuances are never gone into primarily because most critics of the corporation I think don't understand how corporations actually work. And in fact, I'll, you hear all the time people say that limited liability exempts from liability the managers and the employees of the corporation, which is completely false. Limited liability – only says the shareholders aren't liable. But in my view, and Roger uh, and Pallon and Hessens and Rothbard's view, they wouldn't be liable anyway in a free market. So that law does nothing. In fact, I think it's pretty difficult to sue a manager personally for a tort of a um, of, of a driver that he was responsible for supervising, although you could argue that he should be liable. So the the state system actually exempts from liability people who wouldn't have liability anyway. And it doesn't provide a, a remedy or a, a cause of action against people that arguably should be liable. So the state theory is bad on the causation role in both directions. Well, let's uh, complicate things a bit uh, with the case of a truck driver who is reckless and a drunk, and the manager knows he's reckless and a drunk but figures he's the cheapest guy to hire. Are you saying that there might be some some world in which – that manager would be liable to some degree? Absolutely. I mean I, I, I think this is, this is one of these armchair libertarian issues where the whole field has been so corrupted by state interference that it's hard to see what really ought to develop over you – know, with a nuanced kind of a private law customary court decision process over time. But my feeling is that probably that manager would be liable, although as I said, he would probably have – be covered by a type of DNO insurance. Now that insurance would probably have exceptions for like uh, willful negligence or gross negligence. So, but you know, if you make a mistake, 
then you're covered by the insurance anyway. But yeah, I, I could see that. Um, I could see that there would be. Um, but this is all really practically irrelevant because for any corporation that's responsible enough and has the resources to procure insurance for its managers and its officers and its board members, it's going to have insurance for the corporation itself, which the victim can can can. You know, so the victim is going to go after the assets of the corporation, and then as a backup, they have the assets of the insurance company, which would be the insurance company for the corporation as a whole. And yes, I suppose they would have – they could sue the manager directly and then go after his insurer, but this is all just lanyap. This is extra security. Let me ask you uh, – let's go back for a minute to the, the debts question. Uh, I want to ask you if this is a legitimate analogy in your mind. Uh, suppose you have – a some kind of grievance against a local church, like you're suing them for damages. You're su- what, what you're able to get from them would be drawn from the assets held by that church. You would not be able to get into the pockets and the savings accounts of the parishioners, of the congregation. Is that a good analogy for what's going on with the corporation with limited liability? I think it's a very good analogy because, as I, as I was going to say, and I, I lost my train of thought, um, if you extend this net of causation so broadly in the corporate context that you could sue the shareholders for such the for the minimal role they have in the actions of the uh, of the person who committed the tort, okay? Basically, the law considers them passive, and the law, by the way, makes exceptions for what they call. Um, uh, active uh, – there's another term, something like active shareholders. So if you're a passive shareholder, you're just someone who owns stock in a company. You know, all you do is vote in the occasional election and receive your dividends. Um, you, you, you can receive the benefit of, of uh, limited liability. But if you actually interfere with the actions of the corporation or you're such a big shareholder that you start telling them what to do, then you start becoming um, basically one of the management, and then you could be liable. So I think that's a perfectly reasonable exception. But my point is if you hold a passive shareholder liable for the actions of the corporation, then you would also have to hold liable every other employee of the corporation, every vendor of the corporation, every customer of the corporation because every one of them benefits the corporation in some way. You know, If, if I go to McDonald's and I buy a $30 meal for my family, I'm giving them $30. What's the difference if I buy a stock, a share of stock in McDonald's for thirty dollars, and I, or if I if I buy if I buy food from them, or if I supply food to them, or if I loan them money as a creditor? And in fact, a lot of lenders, like bank bank lenders, they request or they require official contractual input to board appointments and how the companies run. Believe me, a lot of companies that have uh, large lenders. They listen to what those lenders say. Those lenders are a lot more influential on the policies and the direction the corporation takes than some little shareholder. So the point is if you have this kind of theory, this broad theory of causation and responsibility, you have one medium-sized corporation. You have 10,000 people that are all liable for its, for its debts, not just the shareholders but its customers, its vendors, every employee, all the union workers, all the janitors, everyone. And this is clearly absurd. <laughs> so, right. And by the same token, you, I think that's why your analogy is apt. The parishioners of a church are not really the owners of the assets, I don't think, in most cases. Right? It's probably some kind of nonprofit trust or something like that. Some, someone be some, someone owns yeah, the church. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, I would think. So that's why I, I heard that analogy, and I can't now remember where, but – it seemed to make sense because I've never heard of anybody complaining that you can't get at the assets of a member of the congregation. I've never heard any complaint to, to that, uh, that that way, but, but it would seem that if you're com- making this complaint about corporations, you should make that yeah, complaint. So the, pro- the problem is if you, if you bring this point up, then the libertarian will say, but the shareholders are owners. So then they will go back to the state classification system, and they will, they will rely upon the state's own classification system. I mean what if the state just used a different word? What if the state said, here's a shareholder who is a person that has the right to receive dividends, that has the right to vote for board of director elections, and that has the right to receive a pro rata share of the assets of, the, of this entity upon a, a liquidation event? That's what they are. In other words, they didn't have to call them an owner because they're not really an owner of the assets. They have certain contractually specified rights, just as creditors do, just as vendors do, just as employees do, just as suppliers do, just as, as, as you know, uh, anyone that the corporation interacts with does. 
Well, Stefan, I appreciate your time and really in, in helping to clear this up, an issue that, as I say, made me stumble early on as a libertarian. And in the show notes page for this episode, I'm going to make sure and link to uh, quite a number of your writings on this subject so people can get more information. I'll link to the Hessen book. It's probably out of print, but I bet there are some used copies out there here and there. The show notes page will be tomwoods.com slash 325. And of course, we will link to stephankinsella.com. We'll link to you on Twitter. People can hook up with you in all kinds of ways uh, as a result of this episode. Thanks so much for your time. Today. Thank you very much, Tom. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. I am heading to the airport so that I can speak in Houston tomorrow at the Mises Circle event. So this episode is going to be going up uh, probably late tonight when I'm back at the hotel. So you late night people, you'll get to hear this episode first. Make sure and subscribe to the show because we give you a dose of liberty education Monday through Friday. You can do that over at TomWoods.com. Remember the show notes page, TomWoods.com slash 325. And remember, finally, LibertyClassroom.com. Get a discount over there using coupon code SHOW in all caps. We've already got 12 courses where you can learn the history and economics they didn't teach you from faculty members you can trust, including me, by the way and many other fun features with more courses to come. We'll have a link to that also on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 325, or just libertyclassroom.com. See you next week, everybody. Thanks for listening. The Tom Woods Show.